Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. The Spark theme for October is protecting and promoting child health. I'm Paula Robeson, your host for the next hour. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that Children's Healthcare Canada operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to Ottawa. Today, Ottawa is home to Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Children's Healthcare Canada is committed to working toward forging new and deepening existing relationships that include First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And we're grateful for the opportunity to share this land as we work to measurably improve children's health outcomes from coast to coast. We're delighted today to be speaking with Dr. Jesse Pappenberg to bring you RSV, flu, and COVID-19 in 2023-24, a triple threat for kids. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Jesse Pappenberg practices pediatric infectious diseases and medical microbiology at Montreal Children's Hospital of the McGill University Health Center. His research focus on the epidemic epidemiology of viral respiratory infections, and he's led national studies on influenza, COVID, and RSV, and has over 130 peer-reviewed publications. He actively contributes to national and provincial guidelines on RSV immunoprophylaxis, uh, influenza antiviral treatment, and SARS-CoV-2's diagnostics and treatment. Dr. Pappenberg is also the member of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, and is the chair of NACI's Influenza Working Group and a member of the Quebec Immunization Committee. It's now my pleasure to pass the mic to Jesse. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. So uh, if you can see my slides... I imagine so. We'll get started. And these are my conflicts of interest with uh, potential, well, potential conflicts of interest with uh, commercial entities. And with regards to today's objectives in the next half an hour or so, uh, we're going to look at uh, trying to understand the disease burden of RSV, influenza, and COVID-19 in Canadian children, and identify children who are at increased risk for severe infection. We'll describe the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on seasonal respiratory viruses epidemiology, and we'll summarize pediatric immunization strategies for respiratory viruses, including the potential use of long-acting monoclonal antibodies and vaccination during pregnancy for RSV. Now, we're not gonna follow that order necessarily. I thought it would be easier if we uh, uh, divided the talk into the three different pathogens that we're going to be uh, speaking about. So let's start with RSV, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on this one because there's a lot of new things. And I think I, I would like to try and focus on what's relatively recent in terms of developments for all three. So as you know, RSV is ubiquitous, ubiquitous, and in 
is a, a very important cause of a low respiratory tract infection in children under five years of age and a leading, leading cause of hospitalization, the leading cause of hospitalization in kids under one. 50% uh, of children will be infected with RFC by their first uh, birthday. And by their second birthday, almost all kids will have, have serological evidence of a prior RSV infection. And it's during that first RSV infection that there's the greatest risk of the virus getting down from the upper respiratory tract and into the lungs, causing bronchiolitis or pneumonia. And in the United States, in kids under five, that translates into over a million and a half outpatient visits, over 500,000 emergency department visits, 50 to 80,000 hospitalizations, and roughly 100 to 300 deaths per year. Canadian RSV hospitalization rates are presented here. On the left, you see how RSV really is a leading cause of uh, hospitalization, especially in children under the first, in their first year of life, with the highest rates in the first six months of life, surpassing even influenza, which is known to uh, have severe disease uh, burden in young children. And on the right, you see hospitalization rate data from Ontario uh, using the ISIS database. And as you see, the children under one year of age in Ontario have roughly about a 1% risk of uh, being hospitalized in their first year of life for RSV. And I would say that most surveillance data from developed countries uh, demonstrates a risk of roughly 1% to 2% of an RSV hospitalization in the first year of life. Now, these hospitalizations in Ontario had a median duration of three days, about 5.5% required intensive care unit admission, and 3.1% required mechanical ventilation. These are the classic host risk factors for severe disease uh, with RSV. On the left, you see uh, the, that uh, it's young age, again, is the number one risk factor with uh, age, uh, with uh, risk decreasing as age increases. And these are data from the United States from before the palivizumab era. So these high risk conditions did not receive any immunoprophylaxis. And you can see that congenital heart disease roughly triples the risk. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is by far the greatest risk, uh, several fold increase com compared to a healthy term infant. And I would like to point out that that risk persists into the second year of life, as opposed to the other risk factors, congenital heart disease and prematurity without any other med medical condition, which really after the first year of life, we fall into risks that are similar to those of a healthy term infant during their first year. Now, prematurity, if it doesn't have any other complications, the risk is roughly double that of a healthy term infant. So that's the risk on the individual level. But from a population perspective, it's important to note that what you see on the right is that amongst children hospitalized in Ontario from that same ISIS study that I presented earlier, you can see that 83% had no known risk factors other than their young age. So most children who require hospitalization for RSV are healthy term children. These are very recently published data uh, from the Canadian Immunization Program uh, Active, Monitoring Program Active or IMPACT on our RSV surveillance that's been going on for now six years. And these are the first five years of data that were published. 13 pediatric hospitals. So these are really pediatric tertiary care centers. So uh, there is a, 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 a severity bias in terms of the types of admissions here. We, we had over 11,000 RSV positive admissions during these five seasons, over of which 50% were less than six months of age. In our data set, uh, nearly one in four were admitted to the ICU. But as I mentioned earlier, these are tertiary care centers. There are a lot of hospitalizations that occur outside of these tertiary care centers. And obviously those would not require ICU care. But in this data set, one in four were admitted to the ICU. And 61% of those that did go to the ICU were under six months of age. So again, really highlighting where the disease burden is early on in life. And the peak of hospitalization incidence for RSV is in the second month of life. Now, RSV year in and year out with, is, a, is a wintertime virus up until COVID, that is. And on the left, you see surveillance data from Quebec. And you can see that from one year to the next, yeah, there is a little bit of variability in terms of the timing of the seasonality. But overall, it runs somewhere between November and March or April every year. And the data on the right are just to show how RSV circulates uh, sometimes exactly at the same time as other viruses and sometimes with a little bit of a difference. So it, it, there is a lot of overlap with other uh, uh, common viruses that circulate in the winter, including influenza. 
Now, I used to think that the explanation for seasonality, seasonality of respiratory viruses lied mostly in this middle category here of the figure where it's the environmental factors such as humidity, the amount of solar radiation, the temperature. Uh, and these things do affect virus survival and the ability of virus to be transmitted through droplets uh, or to survive on, uh, uh, on uh, inanimate objects and, there, and then be transmitted through contact. Uh, however, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly demonstrated the importance of the two other uh, bubbles here. The one on the right is immunity. Now, there are some soft influences uh, in terms of the seasonality of our immune system that gets influenced by uh, the amount of uh, sunlight we get uh, our, uh, and our diet. But I think that um, uh, more importantly, a recent infection with that virus clearly gives us a degree of immunity for the following years. Those antibody levels that get developed will eventually wane and then will become susceptible again. And we get multiple infections with RSV throughout a lifetime. So if RSV is not circulating in a community for many for, for an extended period of time, perhaps an entire season, as was the case in the COVID-19 pandemic, then you wind up getting an increased uh, proportion of the population that is susceptible. And when the virus gets reintroduced into that population, you have a greater chance of spread. But one thing that is required for spread is on the left, human contact rates. So there are there's a seasonality to our human contact rates. We know that school schedule is influenced by, uh, is varies across the calendar year. The temperature influences if we're going to meet indoors or outdoors. Uh, travel and workflow varies across the year as well as the do precipitation. So you need one once the virus is introduced into a community, you need to have that contact for the uh, co contact between people for there to be local spread. And what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic is that virus, respiratory virus circulation for RSV and influenza essentially abruptly stopped in March of 2020 when public health measures were put into place to control the spread of COVID-19. Uh, limiting the social contacts between people was the number one thing that was being done. And what happened was there was no RSV or there, and no or practically no RSV and practically no influenza detected at all in Canada during the winter of 2020-21. Uh, and then what we had was an increase in not uh, susceptibles in, in children, in part because there was a cohort of children that were being born, but also there was a cohort of kids who may not have gotten their first RSV infection uh, uh, earlier in life, therefore delaying that first RSV infection. Now, I want to point out here that some people have used the term immunity debt, and I think it's not inappropriate to use, but it's important that we understand how what it means. It's not that the COVID-19 pandemic measures somehow dampened our children's immunity or weakened our immune system. It's just that there was a greater proportion of society acceptables in the population across all age groups, not just in children. And that therefore, when the virus came, whether it be influenza or RSV, there was more of a chance of it spreading because more people were susceptible. So you can see here that, uh, as I mentioned, there was practically no detections of RSV in the 2020-21 uh, season across Canada. Uh, and then in 21, 20, 22, there was an early season in Canada. And this picture doesn't really tell the whole story. It's a national surveillance study, uh, but you can see that it, it was a, an early season for RSU, but it extended throughout the winter as well. But what you have to do before, but before we do that, before we dive into the details of the regions, uh, I just wanted to point out that in, in during that first winter after COVID hit, there were only 58 impact RSV admissions in our data set when the pre-pandemic average had been 2,500 per year. And the following year, the first winter after COVID, we saw a significant rise to 3,100 uh, uh, RSV admissions, again, significantly above the pre-pandemic average. And this is what I meant by you have to look at the regions to better understand what was going on uh, in, uh, in the field. And what we see here is that these hospitalizations, you can see, were, whereas in the pre-pandemic era, era uh, hospitalizations tend to peak in the same month uh, across all provinces with some slight variability, but there was really things were lumped together quite nicely. But there was much greater inter-regional variability, as you see Quebec having a much earlier and very intense 21-22 RSV season. And then 20, 22, 22, 23 hit with a very, uh, again, very early, very intense, very, uh, uh, very stressful time because we had circulation of RSV that was at beyond peak levels at a time when we normally didn't expect it peaking in October or November. Uh, 
Influenza was starting to it was starting to pick up in in November as well, and we had the specter of COVID throughout all that as uh, as well. So it's the first time that I think RSV really came into the lay public's mind as a a, a real uh, uh, concern. And oh, I apologize for the terrible quality of this of this figure, uh, but it was uh, the twenty uh, in, in the twenty two uh, uh, twenty three season. What you see here from uh, 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 researchers in British Columbia was that. The, not only was there uh, the uh, increased positive test results, uh, but we had also a really significant increase in the number of hospitalizations in that season as well, after uh, practically no hospitalizations, again, in the first year after the pandemic. Interestingly, they also saw a trend or actually a difference with an increased uh, 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 median age of RSV uh, admissions at BC Children's Hospital, going from roughly nine months of age in terms of the median to almost 20 months of age. So again, probably have something to do with children acquiring their first infection later in life. However, I would still say that a first infection later in life for the individual poses much less risk. A 16-month-old can handle bronchiolitis much better than a three-month-old. Now, some people had questioned, was it the virus that was different in, 22, in, in 2022? Uh, actually, it wasn't. It really was a polyclonal outbreak in the way we always tend to have, where there are multiple lineages of RSV circulating in the community. So it wasn't an immune evasive variant. It wasn't a particularly virulent variant. It was just that concept that we hadn't had many RSV infections recently, and they, uh, our immune, uh, the population level of immunity was going to catch up. So what do we have to protect ourselves against RSV in our, our, if you will, in terms of medical armamentarium? All we have is passive immunization. As you probably know, there were attempts at uh, producing active vaccines against RSV in infants. Those failed in the late 1960s. They were formalin inactivated vaccines and they shifted the immune response from a TH1 to a TH2 response with unfortunately non-neutralizing antibodies. And sometimes these children who received that experimental vaccine had more severe disease. So what we've had is the tried and true palivizumab or synergist for over two decades, which is a monoclonal antibody that binds to the RSV fusion protein, which is the major antigenic determinant. In other words, when we get a natural infection against the, of RSV, we develop antibodies, neutralizing antibodies against that F protein. Um, now, it's a very targeted immunoprophylaxis program because it's a very expensive program. It costs somewhere between five and $8,000 per child per RSV season. It requires monthly injections. So it's a labor intensive as well. And you can imagine bringing a high risk child in for another medical visit uh, is, is also a stressful thing for families. Um, but it, roughly speaking, it reduces the risk of RSV hospitalizations by about half in these high risk con uh, conditions of prematurity, chronic lung disease, or hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease. But I'd also like to point out that recently there's been the discovery of the pre-fusion uh, state of the fusion protein. And actually the pre-fusion state is much more immunogenic. And therefore, if we develop antibodies against the pre-fusion state, they're much more effective and can have a much higher affinity. And vaccines with the protein that's a pre-fusion state also elicit a better immune response. So Palifizumab is still being used in all provinces right now because there are the newer products that I'm going to talk about are not yet available, although some of uh, the nercivimab, the long-acting monoclonal antibody uh, that has been approved for use in Canada since April of this year, uh, there may be availability, according to Sanofi, at some point this season. But these are generally speaking, the well, these are the NASI recommendations with strong recommendations in red and uh, discretionary recommendations not in red. And I just wanted to point out that there is a lot of variability across provinces in terms of who gets indicate, who has an indication for palivizumab prophylaxis. Hopefully our newer uh, preventive methods are not going to require such strict criteria. Um, Metimmune developed a highly uh, potent uh, monoclonal antibody against the prefusion protein called uh, nercivimab, and it has a half-life of 150 days. In other, words, in other words, a single injection will protect the child for the entire course of an RSV season, in part because of that greater infinity, in part because of modifications to the FC portion of the uh, antibody. And in randomized controlled trials, you can see that in different populations, the efficacy of nercevimab for preventing 
preventing either a, a lower respiratory tract infection that's medically attended or that requires hospitalization is around 75 to 80 percent across the board. So that's very, that's very interesting uh, uh, um, placebo-controlled data for nirsevimab. Now, obviously, high-risk infants with uh, chronic lung disease, congenital heart disease, or extremely premature could not participate in a placebo-controlled trial. And therefore, there was a trial looking at com comparing nirsevimab to paladizumab for safety. And efficacy was a secondary outcome, and it wasn't powered to detect differences in efficacy. But overall, the efficacy was similar to that of paladizumab, and the exposure was what the FDA considered to be sufficient in order to have protective levels for these infants. So uh, it's, it was authorized for use in these high risk, risk groups on that basis. Now, we don't know how long the efficacy is beyond 150 days. So if you give it too early, it's possible that the efficacy might wane during the course of the RSV season. So we need to time it. Currently, the CDC are recommending in the United States for it to be given to children under eight months of age at the start of the RSV season, and then children that are born during the RSV season. Uh, we are still awaiting recommendations from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, uh, um, immunization that will be produced and uh, published in the spring of 2024, uh, when we'll also have uh, available at, time, at that time, we expect uh, vaccination during pregnancy to protect young infants. And the recommendations will address both of those strategies as a whole. Now, we know that the, the monoclonal antibody works. It works well and it's safe. But the question is, at what cost? So that's going to be an important part. Our Canadian analysis of cost effectiveness will be part of the decision making process for these recommendations and for policy. Uh, as you can see, the CDC's estimate, what their base case scenario was an ICER of or incremental, incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $100,000 per quality adjusted life year gained, which is uncomfortably high. Nevertheless, the CDC did recommend it for all, all infants in their first RSV season, as I mentioned. The other approach, very different, but also uh, uh, seems to be effective, is vaccinating the pregnant person during uh, uh, somewhere between 24 and 36 weeks gestation. They develop antibodies that cross the placenta and then uh, wane over time as it's another form of passive immunization. But these antibody levels seem to persist at protective levels for the first six months of life. And what you can see is that that translates into the vaccine effects effect, efficacy of roughly 70% for medically attended low respiratory tract infection and roughly 57% for hospitalization. Although these numbers do seem to be waning uh, uh, over time. In other words, the older the child, the less protection they have. However, the less risk of hospitalization they have as well as they get older. There is one safety signal is that the relative risk of premature delivery was 1.2. Now that estimate, those that those 95% confidence intervals did crossed the null. So we don't know if this is just a statistical anomaly or if it's a true increased risk. Nevertheless, to try and compensate for that, the FDA only approved the use of maternal vaccination uh, from 32 to 36 weeks. Uh, and uh, even though the study was done in uh, earlier during pregnancy as well. Health Canada is going to probably have a decision on maternal vaccination by the end of this year or at the latest in the first quarter of 2024. So let's change gears and talk influenza. Influenza, it's a major public health problem. And you can see these data that were just published last week uh, from the, in, the Quebec Public Health Agency showing how there's this U-shaped incidence of hospitalizations with uh, the extremes of age being hit hardest with uh, influenza burden of disease, and especially those with comorbid conditions. In children, you can see that children with comorbid conditions have several fold increased risk of influenza hospitalization compared to those that do not. And uh, uh, this, these are data showing the average, the gray of the, of the previous uh, several seasons of influenza in Canada. And then the dotted blue line, this dashed line on the right showed that in 21, 22, we had a late and pretty mild influenza season. Whereas in uh, uh, last year, it was an, uh, an early season peaking in, in November or December, which is re relatively unusual as you can see. But I think from a pediatric perspective, it really hit kids hard. 
you can see the number of hospitalizations in the in our impact network was way above our seasonal average. Again, very early, but a very intense hospitalization season for influenza in kids, mostly H3 and 2 in that first part of the wave. And then there was some influenza B that was uh, uh, later on in the season. These are the, I think, pretty well-known high-risk groups that uh, for having a complicated influenza infection. And even though influenza vaccination is recommended for everybody six months of age and above, I would say that we really need to make greater efforts in reaching and having greater uh, uh, vaccination rates in persons who have these conditions. And it's particularly recommended in the extremes of age. So kids under five, but especially those that are six to 23 months of age, cardiac disorders, pulmonary disorders, immune compromising conditions, obesity, uh, certain indigenous populations appear to have higher risk. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read all these to you, but I think we need to make sure that our children who have these co chronic conditions get vaccinated, get protected against influenza. And the vaccine works. There's variability from one year to the next, but in children, you can see that the pooled estimates of influenza vaccine effectiveness are somewhere along the 50% uh, average, a little bit lower for H3 and 2 because it has greater genetic variability. H1 and 1 that tends to affect kids more, it's higher up to 70% and be over 50%. And in Canada, in last year's influenza season, we have an excellent surveillance program for vaccine effectiveness. And in children, the vaccine was roughly 50% effective at reducing the risk of medically attended influenza. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere data, we often look towards the Southern Hemisphere to see okay, what was, how well did their vaccine work there? Because we can sort of anticipate that it might be similar strains that uh, circulate uh, in, in our, our winter. And it was an H1N1 predominant season. It was a good match for what we have in our current vaccine that's going to be, uh, that's being offered right now. And effectiveness was 50%. So you can tell your patients that it, getting vaccinated reduces the risk of them requiring to see a physician for influenza or be hospitalized for influenza by half. I don't think that's negligible. Um, just a note, quadrivalent vaccines, all the influenza vaccines, except for the adjuvanted uh, pediatric, uh, adjuvanted vaccines are quadrivalent uh, and uh, with two A components, H1N1 and H3N2, and two B components, one from the Victoria lineage and one from the Yamagata lineage. However, it's important, and this is going to stay with it like this for at least for this year and probably for the next, but you should know that after the COVID-19 pandemic, with so little influenza circulation in 2020 and beginning of 2021, there was a, a bottleneck in terms of the genetic diversity of all strains of influenza. But in particular, there have been no confirmed B. Yamagata detection. So an entire lineage of influenza may have been extinct or extinguished, uh, or it just may be dormant. We don't know yet, but we have haven't found any since 2020, which is really quite amazing. So the WHO has said, at least for the, the Southern Hemisphere, which is they're talking about their vaccine components now for next year, uh, they said there's a, a theoretical risk that due to the using influenza Yamagata, B. Yamagata in the production process of vaccines, you might have uh, reintroduced the virus into the population if there was a leak out of the lab, or if you use LAIV with a B. Yamagata strain, there's potential for reassortment with other B, uh, with the B. Victoria lineage and again reintroducing uh, B. Yamagata components. So that's why the, the WHO has recommended eliminating the B. Yamagata lineage and returning to trivalent vaccines. That's not going to happen right away. There are several practical hurdles in terms of uh, the antigens that the, the like there's we have to make sure that we have enough product out there for the entire world. So uh, the, the, the vaccine companies, the, uh, you know, they have their contracts set years in advance. They're, they're produced the amount of antigen based on that, those contracts. Uh, and also there are some regulatory issues with some, some products have never actually had a trivalent version. And some products also have changed their, their manufacturing slightly co compared to their trivalent authorization. So uh, the FDA and Health Canada are going to have some work cut out for them if there is, if there is indeed that shift towards back to trivalent vaccines. So last, certainly not least, COVID-19. So I think just, I like this slide because it kind of, it puts it all together. What is, you know, we hear a lot of different things about COVID-19 in kids. Thankfully, clearly it's not, does not have the same disease burden as in adults, especially the elderly. We've been spared that in pediatrics. Um, and I wanted to point out that 
even during the BA1 Omicron wave that really like 50% of kids got infected during that period of time, our hospitalization numbers were less than what you would see just at the pediatric tertiary care centers for impact with RSV, way less. And less than, and, and similar to what you see in just, again, just that fragment of the pediatric population that required tertiary care, uh, less than influenza. So I, I don't think that COVID-19 is as bad as influenza or as bad as RSV, as some people would like to, to maybe say, uh, but I still think there is a burden of disease there. Uh, we're talking about there, were, there are ICU admissions, there are deaths, and a hospitalization is nothing to be sneezed at either. Now, uh, the, unfortunately, we don't have the same seasonality to COVID-19 that we've been kind of, everybody's been hoping for in order to have like this uh, program where we would vaccinate perhaps at the same time as influenza, uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're moving towards that and we'll see what happens this winter. But a new way of, of monitoring for COVID-19, considering that we don't test by PCR, uh, uh, it, we, it's a very uh, biased sampling of who gets tested, is looking at wastewater levels of COVID-19. And again, you see this huge spike during the BA1 Omicron wave. And now there's maybe a little bit of a rise, but it's not very impressive. Importantly, the, uh, the XBB sublineages have taken over in Canada. And, uh, and, and we've had to change that, the, thankfully, the vaccine that is now going to be available and recommended this fall is an XBB-based vaccine. It's no longer a bivalent vaccine with an, uh, an original Wuhan antigen and an Omicron antigen. It is purely Omicron XBB. Uh, again, just a reminder in terms of when we got our vaccines available for kids, adolescents not, were not long after uh, adults uh, during the, the spring of, and early summer of 2021. And then uh, we had young children uh, aged 5 to 11 just at the start of the Omicron BA1 wave and kids under 5 really only uh, later on in the summer, late summer uh, fall of 2022 for kids 6 months to 4 years of age. And I just wanted to point, this is beautiful data from BC that showed to what extent like the seroprevalence, uh, uh, whether it be from infection or vaccine, just look at how it jumped in kids during that BA1 wave, uh, where it went from roughly, you know, 10, 12% uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in all children to well over 50%. Uh, and then up above 70% once you went through the BA2 wave. So really, most of our kids have been infected uh, at least once and have some degree of immunity. Therefore, they have had at least one immune confer immunity conferring event. And you can see, again, there's another way of showing how the Omicron waves have boosted. This is infection acquired immunity. So anti N antibodies. And you can see that kids have higher level of levels of that infection acquired immunity than do adults, kids being in the bluer dots, adults being the redder dots. Um, and if you do seroepidemiology studies, again, uh, data, fresh data from, uh, from Montreal showing that children have roughly 80% uh, anti and antibody levels. So roughly 80% of kids have still uh, demonstrate zero uh, 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 sorry, uh, antibodies uh, due to infection, not due to vaccination here. Um, and then if you look at the younger age group, now this is where things get a little bit more interesting and complicated, is that these younger kids may not have, did not necessarily go, did not go through the BA1, BA2 wave, uh, and or maybe they were somewhat sheltered because they, you know, they were very early in life and not have the same uh, uh, contacts with uh, people outside of their household, but there the data shows that maybe roughly only about 40% of kids under two have infection acquired immunity. So, so, so that has influenced uh, a little bit what our planning for a vaccination that I'll talk about in a second. There, in, as I'm sure you remember, Miss C, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that was associated with, with temporal association with the previous COVID-19 infection. These kids could get very sick very fast. Um, thankfully, these data from the United States show that it's really not an issue anymore. Uh, it really is a very low levels of Miss C. Do we do, are, are we observing now? And it's not clear. Is it because the virus has changed and the Omicron variant just doesn't trigger Miss C as well, or is it because 
people have been vaccinated and have had previous encounters with COVID-19 and the immune system doesn't respond the same way to a virus, the virus when it sees it for the second time. I like this work that was done by the Quebec Immunization Committee because it contrasts again, influenza and COVID uh, potentially vaccine preventable diseases in kids under five, six months to four years of age. Again, look at that difference between those that have a chronic medical condition and don't, don't in terms of their incidence rates. And then compare also that the influenza incidence rates are higher for both healthy kids and those with chronic medical conditions uh, than are the COVID-19 rates. And then if you look at varicella, which is another vaccine preventable disease, it's actually lower than COVID, hospitalization is lower than COVID-19 rates. So I, I guess it's it's hard to, to kind of, what is the message here? We, we, we advocate for varicella vaccination, no doubt. Uh, we advocate for influenza vaccination in this age group, no doubt. Um, where does COVID-19 fit in? And it's not an easy question to answer. So one way of looking at it is that, well, most kids will have mild or no symptoms from their COVID-19 disease, but who are the ones that are gonna develop severe disease? We know there are some risk factors. And we also know that some kids will develop post COVID-19 condition, which is another consideration. And it's an unknown as to really how, how many kids are gonna do, uh, develop that. So we know that young kids under one year of age are at higher risk of hospitalization. I do think that part of that hospitalization risk though is in febrile young infants under 60 uh, days of, uh, of age, who maybe aren't that sick from their COVID-19, but require hospitalization due to the, the need to rule out a serious bacterial infection. And also there are, it's not uncommon to have kids hospitalized with bron for bronchiolitis, where there is a detection of COVID-19 and another respiratory virus. And really it's impossible to say was, did the COVID-19 contribute or cause that bronchiolitis admission, or was it the RSV or the metanumovirus that, or the rhinovirus that we also found. So NASI has kind of come up with these ideas as to who have, which children are at increased risk for severe outcomes. Those who are medically fragile have medical complexities. And I think you know which ones I'm talking about. Technology dependent children, children who have multiple comorbidities, children with severe neurologic disorders that, especially those that might have impede the handling of secretions. Uh, so chronic lung disease, and there again, not necessarily a child with uh, a very well-controlled asthma, uh, but a, a child that has uncontrolled asthma, we know is an increased risk of hospitalization for COVID-19. Down syndrome or trisomy 21 has increased risk of hospitalization and also increased mortality in children with COVID-19. And obviously other immunocompromising conditions that we might be concerned about. And yet, our young, our young kids' uh, uptake is very, very low in terms of vaccination. And you can see under four, it's less than 10% that have received even one dose, sorry, under five. And under 12, it's at five to 11, that is about roughly half have received one dose. And then once you get into adolescence, you're, we're more in the uh, range of the adult uh, uh, uptake. So hybrid immunity is important. Omicron infection, it, it does give you uh, uh, some degree of protection against uh, an Omicron, subsequent Omicron infection, but Omicron infection plus the vaccination is really much superior. And the XBB uh, vaccine that is now available gives even better protection because it's most closely related to what is currently circulating. Now, Health Canada has authorized that a first or a primary series or a for people who are unvaccinated against COVID-19, due in part to the epidemiology that we just showed that every, almost everybody has had an immune conferring event uh, already, is that for young children where there is less of that chance of having had a, a COVID-19 infection, six months to four years, still two doses for Moderna, three doses for Pfizer. For, for persons five years of age and older, Health Canada also has authorized a single dose. Now, NASI is gonna come out with recommendations on this very shortly. And then you can imagine that immunocompromised uh, persons are probably gonna require an additional dose for their primary series. The current recommendations are strong, for, strong recommendations for a primary series for all children five years of age and above. And for kids under four, 
it's a discretionary recommendation. Um, but now with the with the the the, 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 the XBB boosters having just been authorized for use also in kids under uh, six months to four years of age, NASI, as I meant as I mentioned, are are going to be producing new recommendations shortly. So keep your eyes and, and uh, open for that. Uh, and uh, as what was previously recommended up, up until now, there was no booster that was yet available in, in young children. So there were no recommendations yet. They'll be coming out shortly. And all children were recommended to get a booster if they were five and over. So in conclusion, uh, I think we've shown that pediatric RSV disease burden is substantial, especially among kids under six months of age. And while there are very clear established risk factors for severe RSV, and these children are, have indications for current immunoprophylaxis programs, they represent only a minority of all children who are admitted to, to, for RSV to our Canadian hospitals or who are seen in our emergency departments. So long-acting monoclonal antibodies like nirsevimab that potentially could be given to all healthy term infants in their first year of life life, uh, or vaccination during pregnancy that would also protect healthy term infants could have a very important role in reducing that overall RSV disease burden on our pediatric health care system. Be on the lookout for uh, your provincial recommendations for if there's going to be a switch from palivizumab to nirsevimab in your, in your region. Um, and for influenza, vaccination works it needs to be promoted, especially in our youngest children and in those with high risk conditions. And fi finally, my take on COVID-19 vaccines is that if families want it, we should encourage them to get it. Those that have had uh, 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 can ha are eligible for a booster, in other words, six months or more since their last vaccine or infection, are, it's also available for them. We have a, a, a booster that's now very close to what's circulating in the community in terms of its antigenic component. And certainly I would say, I would, you know, I would put my efforts in trying to reach out for kids who have those at-risk conditions that NASI has pointed out, as they're the ones who are going to benefit the most from COVID-19 vaccination. So I don't have a crystal ball in terms of what's going to happen in the 23-24 season, but I think that what we do know is that vaccines offer protection. So let's go out and make sure that our children who are at highest risk uh, get those shots that can help protect them. I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I see that we've got a few questions that are coming in and keep them coming, uh, folks. Okay, so our questions. Um, Michael asks, are there any predictions for a potential pandemic style mutation in influenza? We have not had a major pandemic strain since 2009. Right. Uh, I think predictions with influenza are a fool's game <laughs> because uh, it's if there's one thing we know about influenza, it's reliably unpredictable. So I think the only thing we can all agree on is that there will eventually be another uh, pandemic uh, potential virus that will emerge, uh, whether it will be uh, an avian variant mixed in with human uh, 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 genes, whether it be a uh, 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 porcine with avian and human, where it'll come from, where it will originate, we don't know. But we're obviously, uh, there's a lot of work that gets put into trying to stay on top of that with sequencing of you know thousands of influenza strains every year uh, to get a sense of what is going on with influenza evolution. So I, I don't know if that's a, if that is a, a satisfactory answer, but it's uh, we have to be on the lookout for sure. Michael, if it's not, uh, throw us another line and we'll see if we can clarify things for you. Um, Frederica asks, where are we in mRNA vaccines for influenza? That's a great question. Um, we are getting closer and closer. So Moderna is probably the company that is closest at having data that will be soon uh, you know, ready for submission. They're not quite there yet. Uh, their first trials, their immunogenicity was not uh, excellent for the B strains, uh, but they've, they've changed that. Uh, they've made some adjustments and the immunogenicity looks good now across all four components of the vaccine. So then they're, they're heading into uh, phase three trials soon. 
uh, it's exciting times. Uh, and and uh, you may not know this, but for that Moderna was working on an RSV M mRNA vaccine before the pandemic. So there's also potential for RSV uh, uh, mRNA vaccines. And the, we have phase three data already for the Moderna product in the elderly. Uh, and they have plans to test that out in younger children, uh, but probably not under six months of age. So that first six months of life mm -hmm. is probably still gonna be for, for RSV, passive immunization, either through maternal vaccination or monoclonal antibodies, but potentially active vaccination with an mRNA vaccine, who knows, right. or a protein subunit vaccine. We don't know yet, uh, but there's lots of, lots of uh, uh, movement in the vaccine field now, especially with mRNA vaccines. Great, thanks. Um, Geraldine asks, what if a child has had COVID twice? Is vaccination still needed as a replacement to the booster? It is. And it's hard to know, like most children won't know, most people won't know if they've had COVID twice. Uh, I mean, some will have been tested twice, um, but we won't necessarily know. But the data that's strongest really is that, it, or it's quite clear, that vaccination plus natural infection is superior to both vaccination alone and uh, infection alone, no matter how many infections a person may have had. Uh, probably what's more important with regards to infection is when was that last infection? In other words, if, it's when, if it was within the last six months, you don't need to get vaccinated unless you are profoundly immunocompromised, moderate to severely immunocompromised, sorry. So, uh, it, so, so I think that the time since the last, last infection is more important than the number of previous infections. Um, Carol has asked a question about COVID-19 infection and the correlation with the development of type 1 diabetes, wants to know what the research is showing in terms of any correlation, and if so, what does that show? Right, so I think that's, that's still ongoing in terms of our understanding of that. What we observed was that there seemed to be an increase uh, in the, uh, there was a, a, an association of increased risk of type one diabetes with either more COVID in the population or an actually detected COVID-19 infection in children. However, we also know that other respiratory viruses can also just trigger that first uh, 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 decompensation of diabetes. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, was it really that COVID was causing the diabetes, or was it just any infection would have precipitated uh, the child presenting for care for their diabetes? Um, so that was not clear. But now some more uh, biologically based studies, as opposed to epidemiologically based studies, are suggesting that COVID-19 people with COVID-19 have a higher risk of developing the types of antibodies that are part of the, uh, uh, that are required, but not necessarily all that's necessary to develop type one diabetes. So there does seem to be now a mechanistic uh, uh, association that we're seeing. So work is ongoing, but I, I think that it does seem to actually uh, increase the risk. And whether or not vaccination can prevent that is an open question as well. Oh yeah, the lots of the, un the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, one of our more shy uh, listeners, an anonymous poster, asked, what is the half-life of maternal antibodies for pre-F? Uh, I might be mispronouncing that. It might be PREF. Um, <laughs> is it different from natural ones if pre-F is more potent? Right. So there's there's two elements in terms of the half-life. There's the actual degradation of the antibody and then also the avidity that the antibodies have for their target uh, that would allow them to, to, to kind of overcome a decreased concentration and still neutralize the virus. So uh, I guess to, 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 to answer the question, naturally, our natural infection, we do generate mostly pre F antibodies, and those antibodies are the strongest or the most immune, uh, 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 the, 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 with the greatest affinity for their target. And that's why the vaccines, the, the active vaccines, these protein subunit vaccines that are made of the pre-fusion protein in that, that pre-fusion confirmation, they work well. There were previous vaccines, protein subunit vaccines in the elderly and also in uh, pregnant persons. 
uh, that were tried, that were the post-fusion confirmation, I mean, Novavax had th that product. Unfortunately, it failed in its phase three trial for both pregnant persons and in the elderly. Whereas the new products that are available, the Pfizer vaccine for pregnant persons is pre-F, and it also is the exact same product that has been that is under review at Health Canada for use in the elderly as well. GSK's product has been approved for use in Canada, and it is a pre-F adjuvanted product for, for the elderly. So, uh, so that, that understanding, that confirmation has made a huge difference in terms of eliciting more antibodies with a stronger response that will have a longer duration of, of immunity. But if your question is related to how long do the antibodies stick around in baby, we know that they seem that if, if, the, if the pregnant person was vaccinated, we know that they seem to be above protective thresholds for six months. However, the vaccine efficacy data in my mind clearly shows that the maternal vaccination works better for the first three months of life than it does for the months four, five, and six. That being said, uh, the risk is lower at once as you get older. So there's a bit of a, a, a bit of a, not a trade-off, but um, it's a good thing that it works best early on in, uh, in, in, in life. And that's not uncommon, actually. That's what we see as well, because it, in, for influenza, vaccinating the pregnant person for influenza is important because Pregnancy is a high risk condition with influenza and, uh, and uh, pregnant persons have a much higher rate of hospitalizations for influenza. So we need to protect the pregnant person, but also uh, we know that we can't give vaccines to infants before six months of life for influenza. Unfortunately, they have not, they have not been shown to work in that age group, but vaccinating the pregnant person, especially in the second or third trimester uh, is a, a way of passive immunization of infants, and it has been shown to reduce lab-confirmed influenza in infants under six months of life, especially during the first three months of life. Um, RSV is not a high-risk condition for pregnant persons. So we're, there's no protection really that we're offering to the pregnant person themselves. It's really just to protect baby. And I would say the analogy that we have currently for that is pertussis vaccination during pregnancy, where again, Babies are at risk for severe pertussis in the first few months of life, especially before they've received their first dose of pertussis vaccine. So vaccinating in the third trimester during every pregnancy protects babies when they're most vulnerable. And, but, you know, it doesn't really, it's not really to protect the pregnant person from pertussis because adults, it's, pertussis is no fun, but it's not a, a high risk condition to be pregnant uh, and have pertussis. Thank you. I, I think we are at our last question now from Frederica. Um, are RSV vaccines uh, similar to uh, influenza vaccines in that they are recommended for parents of infants who are at risk? Right. So we do not in Canada yet have uh, uh, recommendations for RSV vaccines in pregnant persons to protect young infants because the product has not yet been approved for use in Canada. Health Canada is reviewing the Pfizer uh, dossier uh, right now, and it should be, uh, we should have a decision by the end of the calendar year or by the beginning of 2024 on both uh, uh, vaccination for during pregnancy and also the elderly with the Pfizer product. And once we have that authorization, NACI will be looking at the recommendations for the use of both the monoclonal antibody and vaccination of the pregnant person, because it's a very, like it's two very different ways to protect those same young babies that are most vulnerable for RSV, right? Very different programs that would need to be implemented, perhaps different economic considerations in terms of cost effectiveness, effectiveness. also different considerations in terms of acceptability. Um, are, are families going to prefer an injection of their, for their newborn or an injection, an active vaccine for the pregnant person? I don't really know yet. Um, and we know that uh, influenza vaccine uptake in Canada during pregnancy is probably only about 55%, at least that's what the surveys show. And in Quebec, vaccination against pertussis during the third trimester is only 75%. So um, I think that it's possible that we would have better uptake with the monoclonal antibody in, in infants, but that's my hunch. We're currently doing studies to see what do expecting families what, what are their thoughts on the acceptability of both of these very different strategies? 
Thanks again, uh, Dr. Pappenberg. That's the end of our time together today. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and expertise with us, Jesse. And thanks to our audience for joining in. We, we know how busy you all are. And as flu se season continues, uh, you, let's hope you don't get any busier. Uh, we hope you depart here from some practical knowledge to bring back to your organization. Upcoming in Spark, uh, we have a busy fall ahead of us here at Children's Healthcare Canada. In October, we are still bringing you another uh, webinar um, in uh, partnership with Childbright Network called Paraprofessionals, a Needed Resource in Child and Family Mental Health, presented by Dr. Patrick McGraw, and that'll be on October 25th at 11 o'clock. We're hosting, an, uh, together with um, UNICEF, CIHR, uh, we are hosting an Inspiring Healthy Futures, the Future Fit for Kids Summit on October 27th here in Ottawa. Uh, you can visit our website for more information. Um, we're also uh, having a, hosting a podcast that will be released on October 30th with Dr. Justine Cohen-Silver on integrating pediatric social determinants of health for children in Canada. And to continue our busyness, we are uh, right-sizing the health system serving children and youth, and we're on a mission, and we're hoping all others will join us for a series of roundtables taking place between October 20th and November 2nd that are designed to identify key areas of opportunity where recommendations for policy and investment will make the greatest impact. We've got more lined up for November and December. You can check our website to learn more about that. And in December, we're hoping to see you at our conference on December 3rd to 5th in Vancouver. I'll flip the script, High Performing Health Systems for Children. Thank you so much for joining us again. And I hope you uh, return back um, with us here soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>